Okay, good evening, everybody. We are going to take up the Diary of St. Faustina again. And we are at paragraph 1378 of the diary. We'll probably cover about 100 paragraphs, and then we will enter into the first letter of John and some paragraphs from the Catechism. So, at paragraph 1378... Uh, St. Faustina felt so badly that she felt that she couldn't work as the, the gatekeeper. She was about to ask Mother Superior for permission to go to bed, and Mother Superior spoke before she did. She said, you know what, Sister Faustina, you're going to have to cover the gate by yourself because there's no other sister. And so she obeyed, and at the last sentence here it says, when I got to the gate, I felt unusually strong and I was at my post all day and felt well, I experienced the power of holy obedience. So, obedience is so... It's a hidden message in the Bible. It's not perhaps... Well, it's hidden in the way that we looked at... Well, no, it's not true. I shouldn't say that. Some people don't see that in the Bible, that how pleasing obedience is, but we take Jesus, for example, and his obedience... Uh, he was all about obedience to the Father, and that was so pleasing to the Father. So, obedience to legitimate authorities is pleasing to the Lord. So, on one occasion, uh, on 1382, Sister Dominic died at one in the morning. And when she died, she came to Faustina and gave her to know that she was dead. And it says here, I fervently prayed for her in the morning. The sisters told me that she was no longer alive. And I replied that I knew because she had visited me. The sister in Primarian, Sister Chrysostom, asked me to help dress her. And then when I was alone with her, the Lord gave me to know that she was still suffering in purgatory. I redoubled my prayers for her. However, despite the zeal with which I always pray for our deceased sisters, I got mixed up regards the days. And instead of offering three days of prayer, as the rule directs us to, by mistake I only offered two days. On the fourth day, she gave me to know that I still owed her prayers and that she was in need of them. I immediately formed the intention of offering the whole day for her, and not just that day, but much more, as love of neighbor dictated to me. St. Faustina receives a lot of private revelation, well, a good portion of private revelation regarding purgatory. And many religious sisters, after they died, came to her, right, asking for prayers. 1385, in where Christ is speaking there, Jesus says, I desire to unite myself with human souls. My great delight is to unite myself with souls. Know, my daughter, that when I come to a human heart in holy communion... My hands are full of all kinds of graces which I want to give to the soul. But souls do not even pay attention to me. They lead me to myself and busy themselves with other things. Oh, how sad I am that souls do not recognize love. They treat me as a dead object. The Lord has said this more than once. Right? And so what's, what's the, one of the main things that we can learn from this? The importance of having an open heart and a a loving attentiveness to the Lord on receiving him in Holy Communion. That'll be some of the last paragraphs we take a look at the Catechism tonight. In paragraph 1394, at the top, maybe the third sentence, uh, she was, this was a one-day retreat, a day of recollection, and she was, she was feeling the, the sickness, and the Lord... Um, shined this light on her. This light, she says, confirmed me in profound peace, making me understand that I should fear nothing except sin. I forget which part of St. Paul's letters where he said, neither height, nor depth, nor length, nor width, nor, nor devil, nor angel, nor principality can ever separate us from the love of God. Nothing can ever separate us from the love of God except our sin. Right? So, um, 
Uh, we want to avoid sin. That's going to be also what we cover tonight in the Catechism. Uh, 1397, the Lord says, The loss of each soul plunges me into mortal sadness. You always console me when you pray for sinners. The prayer most pleasing to me is prayer for the conversion of sinners. <coughs> know, my daughter, that this prayer is always heard and answered. Okay, so uh, if it's not part of our prayer, this needs to be part of our prayer. Um, at 1399, she goes into the chapel and one thorn of the crown of thorns uh, pierces her. And it seemed, I, what would I see, the, the last two sentences, it seemed to me that the thorn had thrust itself into my brain. But all this is nothing. It is all for the sake of souls to obtain God's mercy for them. 1400, I live from one hour to the next and am not able to get along in any other way. I want to make the best possible use of the present moment, faithfully accomplishing everything that it gives me. In all things, I depend on God with unwavering trust. Remember, uh, when she writes poetry, she writes poetry on different themes. The poetry which, which she began her diary was one about the present moment. And she calls God presence, 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 eternally present. Um, and she says, oh, present moment, you're all I have. You're the, I desire to make the most of you. And although I'm weak and insignificant, you grant me the grace of your omnipotence. So here again, she reminds us, live in the present moment. And if we could add to that reflection, the devil, what does he want us to think about? The past and to worry about the future. When Jesus, well, we don't have, we, the past is gone. If we've committed sins, let's repent. Future may not even come. And Jesus says, don't worry. He says, don't worry about what you had to wear, what you had to eat. Blah. And St. Pio, pray, hope, don't worry. So all, what do we have? We don't even really have credit cards or a home or, or a sweater. All we have is the present moment, right? You know, we, and the, we, we may have a sweater, I may have a jacket on right now, but the most important thing we have is the present moment. Blessed are the poor in spirit. Who are the poor in spirit? All of us. All of us who can't give ourselves life, life or forgiveness of sins or save ourselves. So it's not, the Lord's not talking about the financially poor, but he's talking about all of humanity, the poor in spirit, right? Um, 1404, I kind of underline this as kind of somewhat as a joke, but also to show the difference between Star Wars and Catholic Christianity. So at the last part of 1404, it says, from, this, from that day until this, my love for the hidden God has been growing constantly to the point of closest intimacy. All the strength of my, flow, my soul flows from the Blessed Sacrament. I spend all my free moments in conversation with him. He is my master. So I, I brought that up because <laughs> you guys already know, right? When, when Ben Kenobi in the first Star Wars is talking to Luke, he talks about the Force. And Luke says, the Force? And Ben Kenobi says, well, oh, the, the force is what gives the Jedi his power. But the actor, uh, Alec Guinness was a Catholic. His face lights up. If you ever watch the movie, he talks about the force. Oh, the force is what gives the Jedi his power. He smiles, right? And all he says, the Jedi's strength flows from the force, right? Well, God is not some impersonal force. It's a communion of three persons, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And our strength flows from the Eucharist. So I put that as a kind of a, um, a rebuttal of Star Wars, right? Okay, at 1405, Satan uh, begins to hound Faustina. He says to her mm, uh, near the beginning, think no more about this work. God is not as merciful as you, you say he is. Do not pray for sinners because they will be damned all the same. And by this work of mercy, you expose your own self to damnation. Talk no more about this mercy of God with your confessor, and especially not with Father Sopochko and Father Andras. At this point, the voice took the appearance of my guardian angel, and at that moment I replied, I know who you are, the father of lies. I made the sign of the cross, and the angel vanished with great racket and fury. So here Satan disguises himself as her guardian angel. But what does he say? Lies. Think no more about this work. 
God is not as merciful as he say he is. Ay, ay, ay. He's that and more. Stop praying for sitters because they're still going to go to... Uh. So he tries to throw the kitchen sink at St. Faustina, the wrenches and... Uh, 1407, the Lord speaks, uh, I am the same under each of the species, under the, Euchar- the body of Christ and the blood. He's all there. But not every soul receives me with the same living faith as you do, my daughter. And therefore I cannot act in, a, in their souls as I do in yours. Again, the importance of receiving with devotion and love and openness the Holy Eucharist. At 1411, this poetry is dedicated to the Holy Spirit. O Divine Spirit, Spirit of truth and life, love and mercy, peace and joy, soul's most welcome guest. These uh, these poems that she writes are, are good material for meditation and for prayer. At 1413, uh, she makes a novena to pray a thousand Hail Marys for nine days. I think she does this before the Immaculate Conception. I'm pretty sure she's doing this in honor of the Immaculate Conception. Who else did this? St. Pio. St. Pio did this and the Lord expanded the gifts that he had given to St. Pio when, when St. Pio had prayed this novena. I'm not sure if any one of us has endeavored to do this, but um, I've always wanted to try, but oh, <laughs> I haven't, haven't gotten much, pa- much past 200 Hail Marys in one day. So, um, And it's not the number, but it's the quality of doing it, right? So at 1414 is the Feast of the Immaculate Conception. Uh, now, the Lord allows Faustina in communion with the liturgical calendar. For example, it's a Mar- Marian feast day. More often than not, the Lord lets the Blessed Mother speak to her. So the Blessed Mother comes to her at 1414 and says, My daughter, at God's command, I am to be in a special and exclusive way your mother. But I desire that you too, in a special way, be my child. Wow. And then at 1415, as... Um, she, she gives to St. Faustina three virtues that she wants to highlight, humility, purity, and love of God. And when the conversation ended, the Blessed Virgin Mary pressed her, she pressed Faustina to her heart and then disappeared. Oh, yeah, yeah. Can't wait. It's going to be awesome in heaven to be able to do that. Right now. Um, at 1420, 1420, Jesus' words, what you see in reality, these souls see through faith. Oh, how pleasing to me is their great faith. You see, although there appears to be no trace of life in me, in reality, it is present in its fullness in each and every host of the Eucharist. But for me to be able to act upon a soul, the soul must have faith. Oh, how pleasing to me is living faith. The inspired author of Hebrews says that without faith, it is impossible to please God. That's Hebrews chapter 11. Faith is the assurance of things hoped for. Faith, says St. Paul, comes through the proclamation of the word. All right. You see how bold she gets in 1426 when she's suffering. She says to Jesus, Christ, give me souls. Let anything you like happen to me, but give me souls in return. I want the salvation of souls. I want souls to know your mercy. At 1427, she begins a poem in honor of hidden Jesus, life of her soul, pledge of resurrection, purest love, desire of our souls, who comes to us hidden in the form of bread. So that's a nice poetry uh, uh, that can help us in our prayer about the hidden Christ. Now, 1428, this is uh, this was really hard to read. She feels how her body is decaying. She says, my lungs are disintegrating. Uh, I feel the the complete decay of my own corpse. It is hard to express how great a suffering this is. Although I fully agree to this with my will, it is nevertheless a great suffering for nature, greater than wearing a hair short or flatulation to the point of blood. And at the end of this paragraph, she, she begins to have intestinal problems as well. You know, life in and of itself presents its cross in such a way that we don't often need to do extra penances, right? 
the Lenten practices and other practices that Lord inspires us to do, but rare will it be for us to use a hair shirt or, you know, to flagellate ourselves. By living our weaknesses and people's rejection of us or uh, the tasks that are asked of us in caring for loved ones or misunderstandings in relationships and difficulties, if we live that with joy and love, that's carrying our cross, right? So I'm not, I'm not, uh, I'm not debunking penance practices. They're good. But here we see, and we can see from other saints as well as from the Word of God, that living the works of mercy, living self-giving and self-sacrificing love is, is, is what the Lord desires. So at 1430, she's with a sister, and the Lord has been preventing the other sisters from smelling the decomposition, right? But at this point, the Lord allows one of the sisters to smell it, right? She's working with a sister, and after a minute or two, she made a, a terrible wry face and said, Sister, I smell a corpse here as though it were decaying. Oh, how dreadful it is. And St. Faustina says, Do not be frightened, sister. That smell of a corpse comes from me. She was very surprised and said she could not stand it any longer. After she had gone, I understood that God had allowed her to sense this so that I would have no doubt but that he was no less than miraculously keeping the knowledge of this suffering from the whole community of sisters. Oh, my Jesus, only you know the full depth of this sacrifice. At 1434, I learned the world's existence is maintained by chosen souls, that is, the religious orders. Woe to the world when there will be a lack of religious orders. She begins a poetry about her own decay and dying here at 1435. And the last sentence of the first paragraph, it says, no deed undertaken for God will perish. The book of Revelation, I think it's chapter 14, says that the good, uh, the, I'm sorry, the dress of the bride in heaven is made up of the good deeds of the saints, right? The good actions. So good deeds and actions are remembered into eternity. But sins, what does the word of God say about sins? The Lord casts them from one side uh, into the depths of the sea. In other words, he forgets them, he forgives them. So uh, our life of faith must show itself through love. On Christmas Eve at 1439, while they were in the refectory listening to the, the reading in, in the refectory is the eating place, the Trinity reveals him, himself to her, allowing her to contemplate the three divine persons, right? And she receives a, a moment of happiness and consolation. At 1442, she comes to Midnight Mass. From the very beginning of Mass, I steeped myself in deep recollection, during which time I saw the stable of Bethlehem filled with great radiance, the Blessed Virgin, all lost, in the deepest of love, was wrapping Jesus in swaddling clothes, but St. Joseph was still asleep. Only after the mother of God put Jesus in the manger did the light of God awaken Joseph, who also prayed. But after a while, I was left alone with the infant Jesus, who stretched out his little hands to me, and I understood that I was to take him in my arms. Jesus pressed his head against my heart and gave me to know by his profound gaze, how good he found it to be next to my heart. At that moment, Jesus disappeared, and the bell was ringing for Holy Communion. At 1446, Jesus said, It should be of no concern to you how anyone else acts. You are to be my living reflection through love and mercy. I answered, Lord, but they often take advantage of my goodness. Jesus says, That makes no difference, my daughter. That is no concern of yours. As for you, be always merciful toward other people and especially toward sinners. So even when people presume or assume on our goodness or take advantage of our goodness, God's going to figure that all out. When, when John the Baptist says he's going to fill in every valley, boom, he's going to make everything right. So um, our vocation is to love. At the beginning of 1447, oh, how painful it is to me that souls so seldom unite themselves to me in holy communion. 
Uh, again, further down, I wait. Well, we might as well I'll go. keep on going. I wait for souls, and they are indifferent to me. I love them tenderly and sincerely, and they distrust me. I want to lavish my graces on them, and they do not want to accept them. They treat me as a dead object, whereas my heart is full of love and mercy. In order that you may at least uh, understand some of my pain, imagine the most tender of mothers who has great love for her children. While those children spurn her love, consider her pain. No one is in a position to console her. This is but a female image and likeness of my love. 1448, write, speak of my mercy. Tell souls where they are to look for solace, that is, in the tribunal of mercy, the sacrament of reconciliation. Um, I don't know if the church before this diary began to call confession the tribunal of his mercy, but I'm hearing it more and more in more and more Catholic circles. I don't know if you've been hearing it, that confession is being referred to as the tribunal of mercy. And in fact, even Pope Francis is, is calling it the tribunal of mercy, right? Patrick Madrid, I've heard other, other priests on the EWTN. So you might put a circle around that tribunal of mercy because we're going to see it again tonight, uh, confession. Taking up that same paragraph, there in confession, in the tribunal of mercy, the greatest miracles take place and are incessantly repeated. To avail oneself of this miracle, it is not necessary to go on a great pilgrimage or to carry out some external ceremony. It suffices to come with faith to the feet of my representative and to reveal to him one's misery, and the miracle of divine mercy will be fully demonstrated. Who is his representative? The priest. Jesus says this is the biggest miracle. The biggest miracles are confession and Eucharist. And these miracles are repeated. All right, at 1449, January 1st, 1938. Welcome to you, New Year, in the course of which my perfection will be accomplished. What does that mean? There's a footnote there. The Lord has revealed to her that this is the year in which she's going to die. In a few paragraphs further, we're going to see he's going to give her more details of, of her death. And we're going to see, I think, as if, could it be possible that the diary get more intense? It is going to get more intense. Okay... 1453, but on in my diary, it's on page 514. Um, yeah. Oh, the sister in charge of the infirmary, Sister Chrysostom, is going to be a, a, a source of great suffering for, for St. Faustina. She couldn't make it to the first Mass. There was a Mass in the convent, and she, could, she, didn't, she, she, she had to stay in bed. And so after breakfast, the sister infirmarian... Sister Christosom came along and asked, Sister, why didn't you go to Mass? I answered that I couldn't. She shook her head disdainfully and said, Such a great feast day, Sister, and you don't even go to Mass. And she left my cell. I had been in bed for two days, writhing and praying, and she hadn't visited me. And when she did come on the third day, she didn't even ask if I were able to get up, but asked irritably why I hadn't got up for Mass. She talks about how she tried to. Now, after the second Mass, halfway through there, Sister Infirmarian returned to me this time, but this time in her capacity as nurse with a thermometer, but I had no fever. Although I was seriously ill and unable to rise, so there was another sermon to tell me that I should not capitulate to illness. I answered her that I knew that here one was regarded as seriously ill only when one was in one's last agony. However, knowing that she was about to give me a, a lecture, I replied at the present time, I was in no need of being incited to greater zeal. And once again, I remained alone in myself. Pobrecita. This, guy's given, this, this sister's given her the third degree. Um, and so her heart was troubled here, and the sisters are beginning to murmur about her. Well, maybe she's not really sick, you know. And she wants to go to confession. Father Andras was there. And uh, towards the end of paragraph 1453, right, right above 1454, she didn't, go to, she didn't ask for Father to come because she felt like she would burst out into tears like a little child. 
Um, we're going to see what Jesus' response is in a little bit. But at 1454, that night, uh, the solemn silence of the night made it possible for me to suffer freely. My body was stretched on the wood of the cross. I writhed in terrible pain until 11 o'clock. It seems like from 8 to 11 she does a lot of suffering, huh? I went in spirit to the tabernacle and uncovered the ciborium, leaning my head on the rim of the, the rim of the cup and all my tears flowed silently toward the heart of him who alone understands what pain and suffering is. So she goes in spirit. This is kind of a, a spiritual visit of this tabernacle, and she pours out her tears on the heart of Christ in the Blessed Eucharist. At 1460, Jesus says to her, My daughter, I have something to tell you. And she replied, Speak, Jesus, for I thirst for your words. He said, It displeases me that because... The sisters were murmuring, you did not ask to have Father Andras hear your confession in your cell. Know that, because of this, you gave them even greater cause for murmuring. Very humbly, I begged the Lord's forgiveness. O oh, my master, rebuke me. Do not overlook my faults and do not let me err. So she asks forgiveness, but the Lord chooses to forgive her through confession. Huh? 1460 through his representatives. 1461, O oh my Jesus, when I am misunderstood and my soul is in anguish, I want to stay a while alone with you. The words of mortals give me no comfort. Do not send me, O oh Lord, such messengers as speak only for themselves and say what their own nature dictates to them. Such consolers make me very tired. So she asks the Lord to deliver her from people that just give their opinion, right, to her. That's causing her a good bit of suffering. At 1465, halfway through, Satan comes back and he, the evil spirit howled with fury. Oh, if I had power over you and disappeared. I saw that my suffering and my prayer shackled Satan and snatched many souls from his clutches. At 1466, she has some unique titles for Jesus. Jesus, lover of human salvation, draw all souls to the divine life. May the greatness of your mercy be praised here on earth and in eternity. O oh, great lover of souls, in your boundless compassion, open the salutary fountains of mercy so that weak souls may be fortified in this life's pilgrimage. In the Book of Wisdom, one of the titles that the inspired author of the Book of Wisdom calls God is Lover of Souls. It's a precious title for God, Lover of Souls. And sad, sad that our Protestant brothers and sisters have taken this book out of the Bible, as well as the other six. At 1467, this morning during Mass for a brief while, I saw the suffering Savior. What struck me was that Jesus was so peaceful amidst his great sufferings. I understood that this was a lesson for me on what my outward behavior should be in the midst of my various sufferings. The peace that only Christ can give in a moment of difficulty. When the martyrs have died... That peaceful look and that determination on their faces is what has converted executioners and jailers, right? Those who, 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 who put Catholic Christians to death or Christians to death. For, 1468, for quite a long while, I felt pain in my hands, feet, and side, the stigmata. Then I saw a certain sinner who, profiting from my sufferings, drew near to the Lord, all this for starving souls that they may not die of starvation. She went to confession. Jesus comforted me through this priest. Oh, my mother, the church of God. You are a true mother who understands her children. Beautiful. Uh, how often do we see the church as our mother? I think it's, it's often neglected. Um, Holy Mother Church. 1470, oh, how good it is that Jesus will judge us according to our conscience and not according to people's talk and judgments. Oh, inconceivable goodness, I see you full of goodness in the very act of judgment. So God is our vindicator. He doesn't need a jury. He, he's the best judge. And he doesn't depend on what people say, judgments, criticisms, chismes, gossip, right? God is awesome. At 1471, uh, she continues to write, to write for the comfort of souls, whom I love so much and with whom I will share all eternity. So she's writing for us. 
She wants us to be there with her, right? I can't wait to see her. It's going to be awesome. Uh, at the 1476, um, so what happened was she had been spending nights in agony and not getting much sleep. And then during the day she wants to sleep, but there's one semi-sick sister there and another sister comes in and teaches her knitting and they're talking. <laughs> so sister came in to show her some handwork and sat in the bedroom almost all the time and another sister would come to instruct her on how to do it. It's difficult to describe how much this tires one, especially when one is ill and has spent a night in pain. Every word has a repercussion somewhere in the brain, especially when the eyes are heavy with sleep. Oh, rule how much love there is in you. I wonder if she's talking about the rule of religious life that they're following. Hmm. No. Uh, 1478. Jesus speaks there the second part. I have founded my whole law on love, and yet I do not see love even in religious orders. This is why sadness fills my heart. This next poetry is dedicated to Jesus in his passion. Mm, yeah. Well, and also poetry, someone who's going through through difficulties and even, even close to death. At the beginning of this poetry, she refers once again to Jesus as a good mother. Like a good mother, you press me to your bosom, and even now you give me to experience what the veil hides. At 1482, a prayer composed to Jesus, Jesus as truth, eternal truth. Oh my Jesus, you know that I have gotten myself into a lot of trouble for speaking out the truth. Oh truth, so often oppressed. You nearly always wear a crown of thorns. Oh eternal truth, support me that I may have the courage to speak the truth even if it would come about that I would pay for it with my life. Oh Jesus, how hard it is to believe in this when one sees one thing taught and something else lived. So who is the truth here? Jesus is the truth. He's the source of all truth. And she refers to truth crowned with thorns because the truth, people don't want to hear the truth. We live in a world that doesn't want to hear about truth at all. That contents itself on falsities, lies, and fake news. Right? Okay. So this part of the diary is very, very special now. We're only going to get maybe to three or four of the conversations or dialogues. What happens here is a series of dialogues between Jesus and persons in different uh, situations. This first conversation, I don't know why they didn't put it with bold or underline it. You might circle it. Conversation of the merciful God with a sinful soul, 1485. So here's a conversation with Jesus and a sinner. Jesus says, Be not afraid of your Savior, O sinful soul. I make the first move to you to come to you. For I know that by yourself you are unable to lift yourself to me. Child, do not run away from your father. Be willing to talk openly with your God of mercy who wants to speak words of pardon and lavish his graces on you. How dear your soul is to me. I have inscribed your name upon my hand. You are engraved as a deep wound in my heart. The soul, Lord, I hear your voice calling me to turn back from the path of sin, but I neither have the strength nor the courage to do so. Jesus says, I am your strength. I will help you in the struggle. And then the soul is afraid. My child, do you fear the God of mercy? My holiness does not prevent me from being merciful. Behold, for you I have established a throne of mercy on earth, the tabernacle. And from this throne I desire to enter your heart. I am not surrounded by a retinue of or guards. You can come to me at any moment, at any time. I want to speak to you and desire to grant you grace. The throne of his tabernacle here on earth for us. Jesus again says uh, at the bottom, My mercy is greater than your sins and than those of the whole and those of the entire world. Who can measure the extent of my goodness? For you I descended from heaven to earth. For you I allowed myself to be nailed to the cross. For you I let my sacred heart be pierced with a lance. Thus, opening wide the source of mercy for you. Again here, uh, I never reject a contrite heart. This reminds us of Psalm 51. 
A humble, contrite heart, O oh God, you will not reject. The second conversation that we see here is the conversation of Jesus with a soul in despair in the depths of darkness and depression. Jesus begins this conversation. O oh soul, steeped in darkness, do not despair. All is not yet lost. Come and confide in your God who is love and mercy. Uh, let's see here. Uh, at my book, it's at the bottom of page 525. Uh, Jesus says, My child, all your sins have not wounded my heart as painfully as your present lack of trust does. That after so many efforts of my love and mercy, you should still doubt my goodness. So our sins do not hurt the Lord as much as our lack of trust in his mercy. That hurts more. On my book now, 526, it's still within paragraph 1486. Jesus interrupts the soul because the soul um, is still not understanding. Jesus interrupts and says, Do not be absorbed in your misery. You are still too weak to speak of it, but rather gaze on my heart filled with goodness and be imbued with my sentiments. So what are some of the themes that we're seeing in the paragraphs tonight? Worthy, active, loving reception of Holy Communion, trusting in his sacred heart. Right. Um, the third conversation, or the third dialogue, is with a soul who's suffering or is sick. Jesus takes the initiative and tells the person that he knows they're suffering. And the soul, my sufferings are so great. And where it says soul for the second time, there are so many different things that I do not know what to speak about first, know how to express it. Jesus says, talk to me simply as a friend to a friend. Tell me now, my child, what hinders you from advancing in holiness? A simple definition of prayer there now, right? Talk one to another as a friend to a friend. And the next paragraph where it says soul, she, well, we see how Faustina has been in each one of these situations, right? She, she, she tries to describe how her poor health is an impediment to holiness. And she says, furthermore, nobody believes I am sick so that mental pain is added to those of the body and I am often humiliated. Jesus, how can anyone become holy in such circumstances? Jesus says, true, my child, all that is painful, but there is no way to heaven except the way of the cross. I followed it first. You must, first learn, you must learn that it is the shortest and surest way, our cross. Our cross is the way to heaven, taken up in and through Christ. Now, on page 528 of my journal, uh, Jesus says here, it is because you are not of this world that the world hates you. First it persecuted me. Persecution is a sign that you are following my footsteps faithfully. Remember what Jesus says in the Gospel of John. If the world has hated me, they will hate you also. You're not of the world, and I've taken you out of the world. Therefore, the world hates you. If you were like the world, they would love you because they would consider you one of their own. But because you're not of the world, therefore the world hates you. And so um, this is an, an, an end fleshing or an understanding of that sacred preaching of our Savior. It hates you. And if it persecutes you, it's a sign that you are following in my footsteps faithfully. Ay de nosotros, woe is us if the world thinks great of us. If everyone thinks we're, we're great, something's wrong. <laughs> and so down at the bottom there at 528, Jesus talks about his agony in the garden. He says, know too that the darkness about which you complain, I first endured in the garden of olives when my soul was crushed in mortal anguish. I am giving you a share in those sufferings because of my special love for you and in view of the high degree of holiness I am intending for you in heaven. A suffering soul is closest to my heart. It's important for us to try and understand the anguish, the depression, the sorrow that Jesus fully undertook in the Garden of, of Gethsemane. 
I am sorrowful unto death. He sweats blood. If you and I were to experience one sac second, one second of the Lord's agony in the garden, we would die, we would probably explode, you know? Because Jesus is taking every torture, every abortion, every depression, every rape, every terrible crime, every beating, every corruption. Now, we're aware of it in the garden, and the church has not authoritatively taught, well, maybe, maybe it has, that that depression and darkness was with him all the way till he died on the cross, right? He was a man of infirmities and bore our sicknesses. So when we pray that first sorrowful mystery of the rosary, there's a song, uh, tremble, tremble, tremble. It should make us kind of tremble when we pray that mystery of the agony in the garden, right? The suffering of our Lord. At the top of page 529, Jesus says, My child, make the resolution never to rely on people. We see how tonight, it, just in the paragraphs that we have read, that people have been disappointing. And Jesus tells her, don't place your trust in people. Uh, page 530, uh, where Jesus, uh, halfway through the page, says, Jesus, my child... Life on earth is a struggle indeed, a great struggle for my kingdom. Let's be mindful of the first reading from this past Sunday. Job says, life is a drudgery. It's a campaign of military service, right? Which dialogue are we in? Let's see. Oh, I skipped over. Well, uh, 1488 began the third conversation, someone striving after per uh, perfection. That's the one we're in. It's the shortest one. So there's one, two, three that we're in. Despairing soul. Suffering soul, a soul striving after perfection. The fourth conversation, if we want to put a number four there or make a circle around that. I'm going to circle and put a number four there. Conversation, merciful God with a perfect soul. Uh, wait a second, is this the fourth one? No, no, no. I see the first one. First one's on, yeah, 1487 is the first one, 1488 the second one, 1489 the third one, okay. Oh, 1488, third one, fourth one. Jesus in the second paragraph there says, Your words please me and your thanksgiving opens up new treasures of graces. But my child, we should talk in more detail about the things that lie in your heart. Let us talk confidently and frankly as two hearts that love one another. Again, a description of prayer. And where it says soul, almost down to the bottom in my book of 531, the soul talks about the tribunal of your mercy. Does my soul meet an ocean of favors? Right? So again, it's re we see a reference to the tribunal of mercy. And at uh, on my book, it's page 532, the paragraph that begins, when I contemplate this mystery... She talks about the great condescension, uh, God becoming human like us and experiencing our human condition, uh, condition, right? In the Spanish, the translation said humillación, but condescension is, 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 a, is, is very strong language. Um, hmm, wait a second. Is that all the dialogues there are? I thought there was like six dialogues. Now I'm confused. Let me go through that again. I'm sorry. Conversation with the merciful soul and a dis... Oh, yeah, yeah, no. Boy, I botched it, huh? Okay. 1485, number one. 1486, number two. 1487, number three. Fourteen eighty-eight. Oh no, fourteen eighty-eight. Number five. No, oh, four. Four. Dog on it. And fourteen. Number five. Let's stop there. Let's stop there. And let's open up our Bibles. So we see those dialogues. They can refer to us if we're going through those situations. Faustina was in all of those five situations. I think we went farther in English than we did in Spanish. 
First John chapter 5. We've been using a lot of First John. The diary seems to lend itself to understand and read St. John's first letter. And we're going to go from verse 14. Well, that's 13 all the way to the end. First John chapter 5, verses 13 and following. I write these things to you so that you may know that you have eternal life, you who believe in the name of the Son of God. And we have this confidence in him, that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. And if we know that he hears us in regard to whatever we ask, we know that what we have asked him is ours. Asked him for is ours. If anyone sees his brother sinning, if the sin is not deadly, he should pray to God, and he will give him life. This is only for those whose sin is not deadly. There is such a thing as deadly sin, about which I do not say that you should pray. All wrongdoing is sin, but there is sin that is not deadly. In these verses, what's St. John talking about? The difference between mortal sin and venial sin. Verse 18, we know that no one begotten by God sins, but the one begotten by God, he protects, and the evil one cannot touch him. We know that we belong to God, and the whole world is under the power of the evil one. We know that the Son of God has come and given us discernment to know the one who is true, and we are in the one who is true, in his Son, Jesus Christ. He is the true God and eternal life. Children, be on your guard against idols. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. So these verses teach us that the children of God can approach the Father with confidence. And remember, lack of confidence, lack of trust in God hurts him. Um, John distinguishes here between mortal sin or deadly sin and a sin that does not deal with death. Very good. Let me check and see here. Mortal sin and venial sin. Yeah, this is taking us to this handout that you have now. So the handout has two selections from the Word of God. One is from Galatians chapter 5, verses 19 through 21. And there's a list of mortal sins here. Immorality, impurity, licentiousness, idolatry, sorcery, hatreds, rivalry, jealousy, fury, selfishness, dissensions, factions, occasions of envy, drinking bouts, orgies, and the like. Those who do such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. And the other selection is what we've just read. Uh, talking about deadly sin, praying to God and asking for life. There is uh, there is such a thing as deadly sin. Let's see. Not deadly, he should pray. Deadly, right? Uh, so in the expo explanation here, mortal sins are grave offenses that sever our friendship with God and consequently cause a loss of sanctifying grace. Anyone dying in a state of mortal sin would suffer eternal separation from God in hell. Venial sins are lesser offenses that injure but do not destroy one's relationship with God. The gravity of each sin depends on the nature of the sin itself and circumstances that may either increase or mitigate guilt for that sin. A mortal sin cannot be committed accidentally. Willful or pretended ignorance of divine law does not excuse us and may in fact compound our guilt. A mortal sin requires three conditions. One, it must constitute grave matter, a serious offense against God's law. Two, the sinner must be fully aware that the act is indeed evil. Three, the sinner must fully and freely consent to the evil act, even if he or she does not explicitly or directly wish to offend God. If any of these requirements is not met, then the sin is considered a venial sin. The sinner's relationship with God and the charity within his or her heart is weakened by venial sin, but is not severed. Mortal sin results in the loss of sanctifying grace and thus requires recourse to the sacrament of penance and reconciliation, and we could even say the tribunal of mercy, before any of the other sacraments may be received, especially the Eucharist in Holy Communion. Venial sins do not preclude the reception of Holy Communion. Nevertheless, the Church recommends frequent confession of venial sins to receive the sacramental grace that gives us the strength to overcome imperfections and habitual venial sins. So with that, we're going to enter into the Catechism of the Catholic Church, paragraph 18, it's either 1854 or 1855. 
you know, we could begin with 1854. The gravity of sin, mortal and venial sin. 1854, uh, sins are rightly evaluated according to their gravity. The distinction between mortal and venial sin, already evident in Scripture, became part of the tradition of the church. It is corroborated by human experience. 1855. Mortal sin destroys charity in the heart of man by a grave violation of God's law. It turns man away from God, men and women away from God, who is humankind's ultimate end and humankind's beatitude by preferring an inferior good to God. Venial sin allows charity to subsist even though it offends and wounds it. 1856. Uh, Mortal sin by attacking the vital principle within us, that is charity, necessitates new initiative of God's mercy. 1857. For a sin to be mortal, three conditions must together be met. One, mortal sin is a sin whose object is grave matter. Two, also committed with full knowledge. And three, deliberate consent. 1858. Grave matter is specified by the Ten Commandments. Not murdering, not committing impure actions, not stealing, Lying, honor father and mother, we'll work hard to do that. Uh, the gravity of sins is more or less great. Murder is graver than theft. One must take into account one who is wronged, violence against parents. Okay, 1859, mortal sin requires full knowledge and complete consent. It presupposes knowledge of the sinful character of the act, of its opposition to God's law. It also implies a consent sufficiently deliberate to be a personal choice. Feigned ignorance and hardness of heart do not diminish, but increase the volume. Because God sees. God knows if someone is, oh, I didn't know it's a mortal sin. I don't know. Feigned ignorance. It's faked ignorance. Unintentional ignorance can diminish or even remove the imputability of a grave offense. But no one is deemed to be ignorant of the principles of the moral law, which are written in the conscience of every human being. Sin committed through malice, last sentence there, by deliberate choice of evil, is the gravest. Uh, 1861, mortal sin is a radical possibility of human freedom, as is love itself. It results in the loss of charity and the privation of sanctifying grace, that is, the state of grace. If it is not redeemed by repentance and God's forgiveness, it causes exclusion from Christ's kingdom and the eternal death of hell, for freedom has the power to make choices forever with no turning back. Ooh, that's scary. That someone could choose that to be eternally separated from God. 1862, one commits venial sin when in less serious matter he does not observe the standard prescribed by the moral law, when he disobeys the moral law in a grave matter, but without full knowledge or without complete consent. Venial sin, 63, weakens charity. It manifests a disordered affection for created goods, impedes the soul's progress in the exercise of the virtues and a deliberate moral good. It merits temporal punishment. Deliberate and unrepented venial sin disposes us little by little to commit mortal sin. However, venial sin does not break the covenant with God. With God's grace, it is, it is humanly reparable. Venial sin does not deprive the sinner of sanctifying grace, friendship with God, charity, and consequently, eternal happiness. It talks about the sin of the Holy Spirit here. Mm. That's the unforgivable sin. Now let's go to the section on the reception of Holy Communion, the fruits of Holy Communion. Uh, let's see here. Eucharist. Beautiful. Uh, 1391. Uh, the Catechism. Holy Communion augments our union with Christ. The principal fruit of receiving the Eucharist and Holy Communion is an intimate union with Christ Jesus. Indeed, the Lord said, He who eats my flesh and drinks my blood abides in me and I in him. He dwells in us and we in him. This mutual indwelling is communion. God in us and we in God. Uh, in 1392, what material food produces in our bodily life, Holy Communion wonderfully achieves in our spiritual life. Communion with the flesh of the risen Christ given life and giving life through the Holy Spirit. 1393, Holy Communion separates us from sin. The body of Christ we receive in Holy Communion is given up for us, and the blood we drink is shed, uh, poured out for, the, for, the, for, for many and for the forgiveness of sins. 
For this reason, the Eucharist cannot unite us to Christ without at the same time cleansing us from past sins and preserving us from future sins. What is this saying? 1394 tells us, as bodily nourishment restores lost strength, so the Eucharist strengthens our charity, which tends to be weakened in daily life, and this living charity wipes away venial sins. By giving himself to us, Christ rev revives our love and enables us to break our disordered attachments to creatures and root them in themselves in us. The Eucharist wipes away venial sin. At 1395, by the same charity that it enkindles in us, the Eucharist preserves us from future mortal sins. The more we share the life of Christ and progress in his friendship, the more difficult it is to break away from him by mortal sin. The Eucharist is not ordered to the forgiveness of mortal sins. That is proper to the sacrament of reconciliation, the tribunal of mercy. The Eucharist is properly the sacrament of those who are in communion with the church. Maybe you've experienced that in your own life, how the Eucharist prevents us from committing mortal sins. 1397, the Eucharist commits us to the poor, facilitates the unity of the church and Christians. I wanted to cover those um, because of how St. Faustina spoke about in the paragraphs that we examined tonight about the importance of receiving the Eucharist, the body of Christ. No other moment can compare to that of receiving the Eucharist. So as the paragraphs of the diary now are getting more intense, I don't think we'll go past 1650 last, next time, next Tuesday, God willing, 1,650. Um, if I'm going to celebrate a, well, you, because it's the English Mass, you can go to Mass in St. Margaret Mary's, but I may celebrate a bilingual Mass here next Tuesday. I'll put it on Facebook if that's the case. Um, so, 1650 for the next time to bring your Bible and catechism. And we'll conclude by the three principal mercy prayers this evening. And then I think the night prayer printed out. I think it got printed out. I'm going to go check the printer. Um, so those, you're not going to hurt my feelings if nobody shows up for night prayer. But if you want to stick around for night prayer, um, we'll do that. So let's pray the three principal prayers of the Divine Mercy Chaplet. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Eternal Father, I offer you the body and blood, soul and divinity of your dearly beloved Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, in atonement for our sins and those of the whole world. For the sake of his sorrowful passion, have mercy on us and on the whole world. Holy God, Holy Mighty One, Holy Immortal One, have mercy on us and on the whole world. The Lord be with you. And with May Almighty God bless you, the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Okay, so God willing, see you guys.